Hi, this is your host Sapil Bharatiya and welcome to TFR Newsroom. And today we have with us Nick Mistri, SVP and CISO at Lineage. Nick, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Today we are going to talk about CISA's open source software security roadmap. But before we deep dive into this topic, I would love to know a bit about the company itself. What do you folks do? What are you all about? Sure. No, absolutely. So Lineage is a software supply chain security management uh, platform. We were we were born out of the a uh, use case to be able to prevent and detect a software supply chain attack like a solar winds type of attack. When we look at open source security, how do you look at open source and security? And then we'll talk about software supply chain side later. But let's just just kind of build a baseline about open source and security. A few things about open source is you know what we're seeing, and this is true of all of our customers as well as what the industry is seeing, is that approximately 80 to 90 percent of all software, this is all production software, is actually comprised of open source to begin with. So many many people don't realize how much of their software is actually made up of open source components. So that's number one. Uh, number two, from a securing use of open source, the the major challenge with securing open source is when you're grabbing an open source package, which is a software uh, package from open source, what's not well understood or well under, under uh, defined is what is inside that package. Most of the tools today, uh, security tools today, will identify uh, the first or second level set of software components that are inside open source. What they're not giving uh, information about is the third level, fourth level, and oftentimes we've seen this go down about 20 levels deep. So from a security perspective, uh, understanding your entire inventory of software components is really the first step in terms of identifying all of your risk. So I think you know, from an open source perspective, there are many dimensions uh, from a security perspective is one just looking at uh, having an understanding of your full inventory. And then from that per- perspective, what are all the vulnerabilities or risks associated with that inventory of components? And when it comes to just, you know, keeping a, a tab on inventory, I think the, the best uh, analogy can be with the, you know, automobile industry, you know, or, you know, vehicles, you know, there are so many components. Everything comes from uh, whether it's brake shoe or gears or transmission. If you don't know what is the source of that material, you won't even be able to fix it. So similarly, especially when you're consuming open source, even if you're not consumers, there are so many libraries, packages, dependencies, frameworks, and uh, and it's just not like just one version. There are different versions. There are different providers of the same software stack. So, so talk a bit about uh, how companies understand this. And if I'm not wrong, a few years ago, the Biden administration, they also came up with the whole, you know, bill of materials as bombs, you know, software bill of materials. Uh, so talk about the awareness that you see when you talk to your customers or you have, like you have to actually go and educate them or that a situation is where they do understand what they're asking you. Hey, you know what? How do we track as bombs? There, there are a lot of open source technologies. There are a lot of, you know, proprietary technology. SPDX is there and a, a lot of other projects are there. So, so let's look at, you know, how much awareness is there. Certainly, you know, with the Biden administration's executive order, uh, CISA's focus on software bill of materials, the awareness has, has increased. However, the opportunity for us really within the industry is twofold. Um, one is understanding what is a comprehensive software bill of materials. As I mentioned previously, you know, having visibility into the entire inventory of software or software components is actually a daunting task. Mo- much of the security tooling available today uh, does not do that. They do not uncover all of the components and software. They'll give you the first or second level. And the reason for that is most of the uh, tooling today will actually ask the software, either looking at a POM file or some other file for its directory of components. What we know uh, within the industry is those are almost always incomplete. They're not exhaustive uh, to to begin with. The, The second part of 
of software build materials and SBOMs is there is a, a conception that a preconception that this is a, a point in time and it's simply you know providing the SBOM is a good starting point. But I think it's important to note that it is a starting point. The purpose of having the SBOM is so that uh, we can get visibility not only into all the components, but then start identifying all of the risks associated with those components. And equally important, not just the listing of the components, but how are those components integrated together? What are the dependencies between them? Because the context of which these components are used and put together have a lot of relevance to the actual risk or inherent risk of your overarching software. So the bill of materials is really a great starting point to get a full inventory. From there, it's how do we analyze that information to understand risk? Very, very important point is that as visibility is good, having an inventory is good, but Tracking all those changes, tracking all those vulnerabilities can be daunting as well. Just I think yesterday also there was a vulnerability in Linux. The good thing with open source is that things get patched very quickly because the upstream projects is not their responsibility. Anyone in the ecosystem, you folks can go and find a patch. It's up to the the users now, vendors to actually pull that patch, pull those changes in. So talk a bit about, once again, uh, what is the next step, you know, after SBOM? Okay, you have the whole visibility inventories there, but tracking all those changes and also ensuring that everything is up to date, you know, I mean, solar wind, you get examples. So there are so many examples there where folks were leveraging open source technologies. Patch was there, but they never implemented or deployed it. So no, that's how a, do you look at that part? No, that's a very good question. And we've we've actually worked and looked at this very deeply with many of our customers. And one of the uh, uh, major roadblocks to implementing the latest patches across all open source is this notion of compatibility. What's happening is because your software is made up of many different pieces of open source, different libraries and frameworks, upgrading one component could actually be a breaking change in your software. So there's this constant trade-off we're seeing that uh, software developers are making, which is, okay, do I upgrade? If I upgrade, what's the impact to my software? Will it break my software? Will that cause me to now upgrade five other components, 20 other components? What's the compatibility between all of the different upgrades that I need to put in place? And so that that is a significant challenge to managing and maintaining all the upgrades and patches that are being released. Um, And so one of the things that we look at is this compatibility analysis. How do you decide what are the right set of upgrades and patches that will not break your software but dramatically reduce risk? And how do you look at all of this information? Again, SBOM is a great starting point, but it's really how do you operationalize the SBOM that um, is effective. Now, let's just talk about uh, CISA's open source software security roadmap. I think the the CISA roadmap is a great... um, Great. Uh, it's going to, you know, it's a great starting point. It lays out some very ambitious goals. Um, the ones that I believe are going to have a tremendous impact in industry. One is this ability to share vulnerability data and share that effectively across the entire ecosystem. Um, today, uh, we are getting as an industry better at identifying vulnerabilities and which components have what severity level vulnerabilities. So that's number one. Number two, they have also have an outreach to the maintainers of open source to help these uh, open source ecosystems do a better job and understand where the vulnerabilities are. Uh, number three, though, which I think is where we really help and come in, is not all open source is well maintained today. And it's not as easy as to say to developers, oh, choose an open source that is better maintained, has a lower set of vulnerabilities versus another open source that, um, you know, is not as well maintained. The challenge with that is there's, you know, people have built software over the last 10 years leveraging different types of open source. And what we're finding is a vast, about 50 percent of the software is not well maintained that most people of all the most popular open source packages. And so what do we do with those that are not well maintained? What we are able to do is work with our customers to identify risks, identify 
which software vulnerabilities can be upgraded based on well-maintained open source providers. And those that are not well-maintained, this is where the tough decisions have to come in, where you know, how do we do we create a fork or a branch of our own? If you do, then you're now responsible for maintaining that fork or branch uh, going forward. Or do we ultimately replace it or build it internally? Again, it's equivalent to you know building your own version of that open source, and now you're responsible for continual maintenance. What we do is help you with that analysis in determining what is the right trade-off, when is the right time to make those kinds of decisions based on understanding of risk, understanding of compatibility. Uh, And then secondly, one of the things we're rolling out uh, is an AI model. Where can AI help in terms of making these decisions, but equally important, how can AI help produce using some of the latest code generators to alleviate and solve uh, some of the branching and uh, forking challenges uh, when when it comes to that. Since you mentioned you know, some of the work that the U.S. government is doing, I, I want to draw a contrast with a similar initiative going on in Europe, CRA or Cyber Resiliency Act. But that is causing a lot of problem because while the idea behind the act is great, but it seems that it lacks some communication between actually open source communities and the lawmakers because they're putting a lot of onus on uh, software developers. If I'm writing a small library, I don't know if my code is going to be used in a nuclear submarine, so I should not be responsible for that. What are your thoughts on that? And if your folks are doing any work in that regard as well? No, I mean, that's a very important consideration. And I believe um, the, the open source community is is a very broad dynamic community and it ranges right you have like uh, you have certain open source communities that um are much more active uh and then others that are not and to your point we don't know how these packages will be used um putting the onus on open source communities uh, i don't believe is is ultimately going to bear fruit i think what we need to do and this is where we're focusing are the software developers that are leveraging open source, being able to analyze them, understand their strengths, weaknesses, and risks, so they can choose as well, you know, what to which open source components to pick, which libraries, which frameworks as well. And that will then allow them to, over time, not only improve the risk that's in their software within the open source world um, versus, you know, expecting open source itself to to kind of you know have a certain level of rigor when part of the the value of open source is how quickly they innovate right they innovate quickly they put things out in the world then it's up to the developers to choose harden them uh, secure them so for whatever purpose they're being used for I think that's the right model and I think ultimately that is the the model that's going to succeed because we don't want to stop the innovation that that we're deriving from open source today when we look at uh, either the roadmap or we look at uh, the overall landscape of security in open source do you folks do any work any reports any studies to understand uh, the whole uh, open source security landscape if just can you just talk about it we launched a report uh, looking at uh, a broad uh, set of open source packages i think there was something like 114,000 open source packages that we looked at and we analyzed all of these open source packages to identify some common patterns and what we can derive um, from from that analysis is as we talked about earlier you know there are certain open source that are well maintained and actively maintained with uh, upgrades available and others that are not the the conclusion is about 55% of open source packages actually have available fixes for the vulnerabilities in them. So that leaves a large percentage of open source packages. Now these are the most, you know, we, we pick the most popular open source packages to analyze. And um, out of these packages, we're, we're seeing, you know, uh, almost 50% with no available fixes. And many of these are in the critical and high uh, severity ranges. You also mentioned AI. And of course, uh, I mean, <laughs> we have been talking about AI for a long time, but it kind of became boring and traditional and legacy. But uh, we started talking about AI again after the whole chat GPT and generative AI. Talk a bit about 
what does AI, first of all, I'm not going into the whole can of worms of what does open source means in the terms of AI. This is very complicated. It's not as simple as a lamp stack. Uh, but what I do want to talk about is that impact of generative AI on security and like looking at AI helping security at the same time security helping AI because if you're running AI workloads, you have to protect them as well. Or you can leverage AI to protect your workload. So, so can you talk about uh, generative AI, AI from the perspective of open source and security? No, certainly. And um, we, we've had a lot of good discussions with our clients here uh, on this topic. Uh, you know, one of the obvious concerns with using generative AI uh, from a software development perspective is that we know there are malicious actors that are able to introduce, uh, you know, uh, malicious packages and frameworks uh, within the suggestions that these uh, generative AI solutions are providing. We've seen a few examples, you know, with ChatGPT uh, being compromised so that uh, it's suggesting compromised uh, components to use. So that's number one. And number two, the other aspects of, of potential risks is obviously uh, you know, tampering or poisoning of your data sets that, that come out with false information, especially if you're using that in terms of, of generating software or generating, uh, you know, potential security control configurations. Um, in order to address those, you know, it is really important that we leverage AI and its capabilities uh, effectively. And what we're saying, one, one approach that we're taking is leveraging AI to identify risks, be able to perform the compatibility analysis I talked about earlier. Uh, it, it is pretty much a, you know, a massive combinatorics problem. You're looking at thousands of potential fixes across thousands of components and compatibility across all of those. So AI is very effective at producing, uh, you know, what are optimal paths to resolving the greatest number uh, of risks while not introducing breaking changes. That said, where we see the power of generative AI is now using this information to then make the decisions of, let's say, we want to fork as opposed to upgrading. And when we do that fork, can we use generative AI to actually build the code for us? And the answer we're, we're seeing uh, through our work with our customers is absolutely yes. So, but instead of simply saying to the generative AI, I need a fork for this, it's a well-informed set of instructions to the generative AI on how to actually build that fork based on this other understanding of compatibility, of the risks, et cetera. And that minimizes the AI being a compromise to produce a answer or a solution that the bad guys want you to use because it's following your precise instructions about your exact software um, all, you know, starting with this uh, software bill of materials. And we see a, we see that as a lot of a significant promise in how to use generative AI to solve and reduce risk, um, but be, but using the information and from your perspective, your context, uh, so you get the right outputs from from generative AI. The other benefit of of large language models and is the natural language interface. One of the things that we launched has been extremely effective. As you know, uh, cybersecurity is, is a fairly complex field. And as many great dashboards and widgets and everything else and reports companies like, like Lineage produce, we're never going to answer all the questions that people want answered uh, based on the data and understanding from a cyber perspective that we have. So the natural language interface has, has been a really um, a nice addition to our product, allows human beings to interact with their data set and get relevant information back in natural language. So you can ask, okay, what are my greatest risks? Why is that risk so difficult? The other benefit of this interface is when we provide recommendations on how to fix these components, one of the things we found is that Developers are at varying de levels of skill sets. They also will have familiarity with one framework or one library or one code or language type. And when we're remediating 
uh, open source, they come in so many different varieties of, of frameworks, libraries, and, and languages. And so what we're leveraging the large language model and the natural language interface is providing instructions to the developer on how to implement the fixes. And if they get stuck or if they have questions, they can just ask uh, the AI bot, okay, what do I do with this instruction? I don't, and it'll guide them through. And the beauty is that it'll guide them through in a natural language interface. So I think I see the leveraging AI has a lot of different useful, uh, you know, impl implementations in terms of helping us solve uh, and address the cyber challenges with, with open source. And we're going to continue down that, that path. Talk about the realistic impact that you see will be there either on public sector like federal agencies or private sector. Uh, how is it going to help? And also, do you feel that, you know, within like last few years, actually the U.S. government is doing the right thing, right approach? Also, the problem with the, the CRA was the lack of communication. Uh, I mean, they do work closely, but I think um, like just two two or three weeks ago, there was a meeting at, once again here at White House, where Linux Foundation, a lot of folks came there to discuss the whole open source and security, where you feel that, you know, actually U.S. is in a way kind of leading the word when it comes to open source and security. From what I've observed, and we're also involved in the uh, CISA has several working groups within with the industry and the government working together with regard to the software bill of materials, with regard to identifying risks. How do we communicate that? How do we share this information um, and what kind of requirements um, you know, would be too burdensome or challenging uh, for companies. And so I do, from my perspective, at least, I believe the U.S. government is taking a very balanced approach. They are not moving the goalposts with saying, no, we need to hold, uh, you know, the, the whole underlying premise here, which I think is a, a shift and a, and a good shift, is holding software producers uh, accountable for their software and understanding the risks in their software and not shifting that risk to the user's of their software. I mean, that, that is the underlying premise. That said, they also recognize and working hand in hand with CISA that this is not a change that's going to happen overnight, right? They are looking to work with the industry, understanding this is a multi-year effort to ultimately be focused and partnering together on how do we drive risk out of our software. Uh, ultimately, and what's the, the recognition is any of our runtime security controls, as good as they are at preventing or detecting a potential attack, the challenge is you're only as good as your software. So if your software is not built secure, so secure by design, um, you, know, you will be compromised. There'll be open opportunities for for compromise. And, and I, I believe that is the right focus. I do believe they're going about it the right way. Um, it's a little bit of, yes, we're pushing, but we're also working with you so that it's not too onerous. Um, and it's a constant dialogue. And I, and I think that it, it isn't a, a workshop at a time. It is literally weekly discussions of how do we move this forward with constituents on all sides of the equation. And that means not only companies that produce and sell software to the government, but then also on the other side, uh, they include uh, software consumers. So not only the consumers from a government perspective, but from large corporations. If you think about it, all of these uh, software vendors are both consumers of software as well as producers of software. So in, in a way, they too are help, you know, helping influence how CISA rolls out the regulations and requirements. Because security is, uh, as you were saying earlier, bad guys have to be right only once. You have to be right, you know, handed one time. Security is not a product, it's a process. It's also, it's not just all the tools. You need to have a culture as well. They also say, you know what, security is everybody's problem. When something becomes everybody's problem, it's actually nobody's problem. So I want to talk about the importance of culture and what advice you have for these agencies or organizations so they can build right cultures, the right culture internally uh, so that the tools that you provide, they can actually take advantage of those tools. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and one of the things that, 
um, you know, I personally have been pretty engaged in with the government as well as on the, uh, you know, the produce software producer side and other developers of software is, you know, the, if I can frame, I can take a few minutes and frame up where, where the challenge right now is. So a lot of great work with, with DevSecOps, CICD pipelines, very mature uh, tool sets are there for the most part. All the security testing is there. What we are currently in, though, right, and this is part of the challenge, is we are now overwhelming the software development community with vulnerabilities. And we're identi- we're, our ability to identify vulnerabilities has increased substantially, which is great, right? Um, however, what it's now causing is we have tools that because we shifted left are, uh, are identifying vulnerabilities and fixes and is causing a significant amount of contention with terms of resources and production. So now developers are spending more than 50% of their time addressing vulnerabilities and fixes. The challenge with that is what we know from our analysis is a vast majority of those fixes that are being reported actually do not reduce risk. And so now you're taking away precious developer time, and these developers would rather be creating something new than patching a vulnerability, but you're also taking away their time on fixing things that do not result in substantial risk reduction because those uh, patches are out of context. They're not giving them the full context of their specific software, the compatibility analysis, how it's configured, and all of the context information is critical to how uh, a much risk reduction or prioritizing which things you fix. And we also hear a lot within the current uh, uh, discussion about how do we prioritize vulnerabilities, right? Because why? Because we're, we're facing this challenge. We're overwhelmed with vulnerabilities. Developers are strapped. We want to produce uh, helpful features, capabilities, but also reduce risk. The challenge with the current discussion, this is where I, we want to move it to the next level, is that prioritization is is looking at things like um, not only exploitability, which is good, but it's looking at things like reachability. Is that is that component reachable uh, when it's executing? Well, the challenge there is that the bad guys can still access that code. They can whether it's dormant or active. At runtime, it can still be compromised and used as a vector. Um, so one of the things we're proposing and we're helping drive is kind of this, it's almost shifting left of shift left, is really looking at continuous sourcing and securing all of the third-party open source components that are coming in, but doing so within the context of your entire software. And so now you're focused on targeted fixes that minimize, that actually reduce risk and optimize uh, developer time in the process. And I think that's the trade-off we need to make. Um, I think I think we've shifted, uh, you know, our, it's almost like a gut reaction. We have so many vulnerabilities, we need to go address them. Yes, but now we've created this problem of there are too many vulnerabilities and developer efficiency. And then, then we switch over to the other side. Okay, there are too many vulnerabilities. Let's just pick which, which, which ones and prioritize which ones we believe are the ones that are causing the most problems. That's, that's good, but then that leads us to create um, frameworks of decision-making that may not be risk-aligned. And so what we're looking at, okay, we need to all come together, use all of this automated tooling. We have full visibility in the entire context of your software. We have visibility into what you're sourcing. Let's bring that information together to reduce risk, but optimize developer time and efficiency and that real and make that real uh, trade-off as a net benefit to both the developers and, and cybersecurity. Nick, thank you so much for taking time out today. Of course, it was great to learn more about Lineage and also um, how folks can, you know, kind of secure their open source, uh, of course, the whole code base that you're running. Thanks for all those insights, and I would love to chat with you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. 